Alright, we have two movies this week. It was obviously supposed to be three, but whatever is going on with Hotel Artemis in my theater is like a huge clusterfuck right now. Because they had, obviously I'm watching these on Thursday night, which I don't normally do, but um, and they had times posted tonight for Hotel Artemis that ultimately just disappeared without a trace. And as of right now, it's also not listed uh, for tomorrow, despite the fact that it's on the road sign and there's a poster for it outside in the poster case. Um, I, I do not know. I'm hoping we do have it, but as far as actual ticket sales and times, there does not se it does not seem to exist. So hopefully we get that figured out sometime in the middle of the week and then I'll be able to see it and then it'll be on the next one. So, in the meantime, we have these two, um, and we're going to start with Hereditary, which is yet another one in the long line of the much-buzzed-about horror movies that have been coming out, particularly from A24, um, and, and this one had, obviously, a lot of buzz around it being, like, yet another movie called This Generation's The Exorcist, but this time, like, it was, it might as well have said, This Generation's The Exorcist, but we mean it this time, <laughs> um, and, yeah, it's going to be really hard to talk about this movie without kind of just kind of, you know, running through the same formula of reviewing a movie like this, like using words like unsettling and dread and foreboding and all that. It's kind of... But, yes, um, it does fit all of those, despite how overused those are. Um, they, they absolutely um, work here, like, to a T, so there is that. And the I actually really liked it from the opening alone, when we kind of get a bit of backstory on the family through the fact... Obviously, the whole thing that sets this off is the death of uh, Tony Collette's mother. So, the opening thing was... It's kind of like... It's like opening text, and that usually kind of tells you like what's going on or what the setup is. But it's perfectly aligned and set up and reads like um, her obituary, which I thought was a really kind of weird and cool thing to start off with and felt very unique, a very unique way to do that sort of introductory text we usually see. Um, and then that goes right into a shot that kind of blew my mind, not necessarily because of the shot itself, which is amazing by the way, where, where obviously Tony Collette's character makes these uh, dioramas, like these, you know, it, 3D sort of imagery, if you're unaware of what that is, like models, um, and it zoom in, it zooms in on what is just one of these dioramas, but then it turns into the inside of the actual house while it's zooming in, like almost seamlessly in the shot, as Gabriel Byrne walks through the door without there being like a really, really visible cut. You can look if you're looking for it, but you can see it if you're looking for it, but. Yeah, it looks almost seamless, and what blew my mind about that, not just about what the shot was, but the fact that I believe this is a first-time director. I think I heard Tony Collette say that in an interview. Uh, first-time writer-director, and it's like, that in itself is something I can hardly fathom, that we're getting shots like this from a first-time director. Uh, and, and that's obviously uh, a great starting point. Hopefully this is one of those directors that, like, kind of used everything that they had in their first movie. Hopefully we get a lot more um, but uh, from this dude. But the thing about this also is um, one of the things that have, has been just as buzzed about as the movie itself and the just how completely insane it is, is Tony Collette's performance in itself. I, I don't know that this is going to happen. It, the movie itself might be a bit too out there, but there has been, like, especially after the success of Get Out, and particularly Daniel Kaluuya getting a Best Actor nomination for that, people have been really talking up that Tony Collette can do the same this year, um, at least nomination-wise. And I think the interest, I think where a lot of that comes from is the fact that the great thing she does here is, and this also is um, a compliment to the material that she has, is the fact that for like 90% of this movie, she has to give like a really big performance. Um, there's certainly subtleties here and there, and there are more downplayed scenes than others. Um, but like 90% of it um, feels like it's not even in a horror movie. It feels like it's in some character drama or something, like Ordinary People or something, um, which is which is great in a, like, a really, like, if you talk about The Exorcist, and you talk about how 
a, like the last third or so of the exorcist is so famous a lot of people tend to forget just how much of the exorcist is downtime and just kind of the character drama aspect of it um and this this is a lot like that um to where it makes the third half all the or the third third i guess um all the more you know not just emotionally investing but just kind of now that we're so invested in them as human beings makes it all the more terrifying um and there's like there's one particular scene where she's in a support group and the shot is like seemingly like, from all the way to the back of the room and without breaking just comes all the way forward until it's like almost like right about here in front of her um and it's just it takes like that and she goes further into that scene not just in that one shot but um Stuff like that to where it just you really get to see just how much she really sank her teeth into this, regardless of whether it's big or smaller. Of course, like, even the smaller scenes in this movie still feel like... In, in another movie, they would be the big scene, and they're the small scenes in this, as in regards to her performance and how exactly what it is that she has to tackle. So um, I thought that was done really well. And then there is... Um, as far as the horror aspect of it goes, there is because there are quite there are quite big portions of this movie to where it gets so in, invested in the um, character drama of it that uh, and the whole like showing us the grieving process in a really kind of deep way. Um, sometimes you might possibly forget that you're watching a horror movie sometimes, um, but that stuff is always always finds its way back in uh, just fine. And it even takes, like, old tricks, like, um, when you just see, seeing, like, figures in the dark, um, and still uses it in its own unique way. And the great thing about this movie, um, that you may have already heard, is that, surprisingly enough, it's not really a jump scare movie. I can think of maybe two, one or two jump scares, and they're both, like, towards the very end. Um, so, like, all the stuff, like, all the big scares, when I say, like, there's people in the shadows and all that... This stuff isn't, like, accompanied by music or loud noise or anything like that. Um, there's one in particular I won't give the details of, but there is a, one big shot of a bedroom, and it's one of those cases where the shots, then nothing changes. The shot just stays in place, and it's just this one image. But as your eyes adjust to what the darkness is, you kind of start to see something that's been there the whole time that you just didn't notice before, but the shot stood there long enough to let you see it. And you can, if you're watching it with a crowd, you can kind of hear gradually people start to see it. And <laughs> it's really... Uh, that's, that's a really great way to use that. Um, and, um, but there is also the use of, like... Uh, sound like obviously not big sounds or anything like that but like um well stuff that's kind of might seem a bit gimmicky like the um the clicking noise that the girl makes with her tongue um and how they use that throughout the movie but the first time we hear it was really interesting because it's like it faded into the audio with the score like it sounds like it's in the score when we're first hearing it and it kind of like gradually fades in and we realize that it's a sound that she's making um, and that was a really, like, even sound effects in this movie, they're gonna play, like, a big part, get their own, like, introductory scene <laughs> like that, which is really interesting. Um, now, there is also something here that, um, I don't, I don't think gives too much away, because plenty of movies have this. Um, but I won't say what it is, obviously, but this is one of those movies that has a moment in it. Obviously, there are moments in this movie that are, like gonna be talked about for a long time and imagery you will not forget but there's one particular moment in this movie that makes it one of those movies that has a before and an after this moment um <laughs> if that hopefully that's vague enough um and it's one of those cases where it happens and not only is the rest of the movie changed forever because of this but it's another one of those cases where if you're watching it with a lot of people like i was this they put this this movie's so buzzed about, this is me getting mad at my theater again, but it's a 7 o'clock showing on Thursday of this movie that everybody's talking about. It is in the smallest auditorium that we have. I'm in the back row. I'm in the back row, and the screen's still right in my damn face. Uh, <laughs> and so we're all packed in here, and when this moment happened, number one, somebody down the row from me almost jumped out of their seat and just screamed, Fuck. <laughs> 
And then, after it had happened, and the movie kind of just kind of lets that moment sink, like, that happens, and then the movie just seems to, like, stop and go, almost like in slow-mo, like, it's almost like time slows down. Um, and you could just sense that, like, everybody in the theater, I feel like everybody in the theater, like, contemplated leaving. Um, <laughs> because it just felt so tense in there, but nobody moved. Nobody at all. Um, and that, it's always great. I mean, it's great, obviously, to have those moments throughout your movie and not just bank on one scene. But it is also really great that you can, even if the rest of the movie doesn't pay off, this one scene alone... Um, would have made the movie unforgettable and would have had that much impact just on its own. But the movie keeps going quite a bit. Uh, there's still quite a bit of the movie left after this. Um, and there's plenty... Of, it's also one of those movies where it's very... There's also kind of a lot of Rosemary's Baby in it. Um, and especially when, like... Um, like, little touches, like, when they're at um, her mom's funeral... And there's, like, just a dude in, standing in the corner, like, smiling. And this dude, by himself, just looks... Not just what he's doing or the vibe he gives off, but just his appearance just looks so out of place with this environment. Um, and it's... Um, not to say whether it comes back or not, but... Um, and there's just things like that, and that's kind of the vibe that the whole movie has, because... It's definitely one of those movies where you can point out, like, well, why would this character do this? Why would this character make that decision? What are the odds of this happening? Stuff like that. But the whole thing, and it, it seems to absolutely be intentional, it, the, it's basically like there's this whole, like, the events of this movie are, like, driven by an, an, an other, another force, basically. Um, to where, like, to where, like, things seem intentionally just so out of place, and just so, like, they don't belong, or, like, it would seem odd that one thing would lead to another, but it all feels very kind of calculated in the long run, in a way that, like I said, even if it seems, like, really outlandish, it, it, it's kind of meant to feel like it's, like, totally off balance, um, which is, yeah, just adds to the whole insanity of it. And it's one of those things where a lot of the times it may be subtle enough to where you feel like things are off balance, but you can't really quite add up in your head immediately as to why, but you can just feel it. You can, like, sense that something is horribly wrong, <laughs> um, before things even really start to take off, um, which is great. And then there's also stuff like, um, I was talking about how they don't use... I guess I should take back a little bit what I was saying about how there's no jump scares. There is one particular moment that I think is technically a jump scare, but the reason I struggle to use that term is because you're... It's what a jump scare should be. You're not jumping at music and you're not jumping at noise because the scene, it's totally silent. But, the, but it still has the effect of a jump scare because of the way it's edited. Because it's like him, we kind of have like a point of view shot of Alex Wolf scanning this room, and he thinks he sees something, and the cut is like so quick but so brief to it that it like makes us kind of jump back in the way that a jump scare would if we had heard something loud, but we didn't hear a damn thing. It's just the way it was shown to us kind of makes us get thrown back, um, and that's. And that's, yes, that's absolutely <laughs> uh, what we're looking for in movies like this. Um, and there's even stuff like, um, I was talking about the little touches, like the dude at the funeral. There's also, like, the treehouse. Like, just the way the treehouse feels like it's looming around in scenes that it may not even have importance in. Because it's like, it's almost it almost feels like every window of the house we can see this damn treehouse out of. Um, and that, um, the lights that Tony Collette turns on in there that have, like, this red glow coming out of it when she's, like, in there, it's, yeah, it's really, yeah, insert any of those words that I said are overused in reviews of movies like this, <laughs> it, it definitely fits. Um, and yeah, there are, and there's also some, not just, um, like, the diorama coming to life, um, as far as great shots go, but there's also this really unnerving shot of, uh, Obviously, we're seeing a, um, a casket being lowered into the ground, but the camera's, like, really far away from this, and the camera goes down with it, and it's like the camera just goes through the grass and then into the dirt underneath, and it's like, how do you, how is a shot like that even accomplished? I mean, you, I mean, you can imagine when you're looking at it, but still, I just, it's, 
yeah, it's just really, really good stuff in regards to just how, how it looks and how it's shot, let alone everything else this thing is offering. Um, and there's also, I mean, after a while, it does get into uh, some stuff we've seen before, especially later. Like, there's there's stuff with bugs, there's stuff with, um, you know, looking up books and, you know, what all is in that and kind of piecing stuff together. Um, there's seances, but even so, um, even as played out as the concept might be, the seance scenes still do kind of work. There's one particular one also. This is another kind of collective experience, but um, when I, the tensions were already like really, there was a lot in this theater, especially because we're all so packed in there, but um, the, the first seance scene is just Anne Dowd standing in the dark, and she's lighting a match and lighting a candle, and there's just darkness surrounding her. But because we know that a seance is about to happen, in a movie with the stuff we've already seen in it, you could just almost hear all the people saying, like, oh, God, like, no, not a seance scene in this movie. And, and you, you could just feel the tension. Um, and it's great. Um, but, yeah, there is, um, like I said, it does feel like we get some stuff we've seen before. There's the whole... Um, Tony Glass character sleepwalks, so we have to do the whole thing where sometimes we're not quite sure what's a dream and what's real, which is kind of a territory that it comes at night already recently um, took over quite nicely. Um, but it's, it does work here also, even if it does feel like explored territory at this point, um, especially in such a similar way. Um, and, and yeah, there are things to where it's like, um, like, the, like the, the blue light... Uh, thing I think is a bit, especially for a movie like this that's so downplayed about the horror aspect of it, that seemed a little out of place and a bit too literal, I think. So, um, but yeah, there is still, like I said, I don't know if the movie worked better when it was like constantly ambiguous, like when you could, just, like when it basically just played up like an ordinary people type, but it just had such a sinister undertone that you can almost like feel a supernatural force like moving everything but and if, if maybe it would have been better if the movie stayed like that instead of like going full-on horror like it does um i that i don't know i'm not saying anything definitively yet just on a first viewing this is definitely like this is one of those movies where the more you're watching it the more you're like this is definitely some stuff I'll have to work out the next time I see it, because it's like, you're watching it like, you know you're going to see this again. <laughs> um, two or three more times, at least, just to make sure uh, you've got everything, or to see some of the things that you might not have before. Um, and yeah, it is not another one of those ones where it's like, you can probably take it as a bit of a metaphor, kind of like the Babadook with mental illness, or A Quiet Place with the, um, the fear that comes from, you know, parenthood or whatever. And in this, it's kind of like the fears of what you uh, just inadvertently inherit from your family, whether you like it or not. Um, I'm sure there's something like that in here. So, uh, yeah, I do... I don't know. I'm like I'm contemplating um, as far as a rating goes. <laughs> because it's like I did have it at one thing when I started this, but I don't know if I want to go higher now after having talked about it, but, uh, yeah, I'll figure that out, but, um, yeah, obviously this is really great stuff, this is another one that does kind of live up to its hype, and really does feel, even though, like I said, it does feel like it's some explored directions before, um, there is still definitely something that he made sure, he, if he was going to explore the same territory we've seen in movies before, he was going to take it above and beyond, and he made sure that he did that, so... Yes. Um, oh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that um, I've talked about before how Alex Wolf is like so incredibly, significantly much more talented than his brother. Um, yeah, he pretty much totally solidified that here. He is like, oh, I did not expect. I knew I knew he was the more talented brother, but I had no idea that this guy had this kind of stuff in him. This is really intense shit. You have to really, really throw yourself into, and holy crap. Um, especially for a dude so young, this is, like, an insane performance, uh, like, right up there with Tony Collette's, like, they, they have to, like, they kind of match each other, it's not like Tony Collette's, like, way off doing her, you know, I mean, obviously she's been an acting goddess forever, whether it be, you know, comedy or drama or even, she's been in horror before, she's tagged this territory with her Oscar-nominated performance and The Sixth Sense, um, but yeah, she does get to go in some bigger directions, 
um, and a lot more kind of exploring many different facets of this character and where this character ends up exactly. Uh, she's got a lot to do, but they both just really, really pull through. And that's not to say, um, that's not to leave Gabriel Byrne in the dust, who also kind of, he's stuck with the whole skeptical dad role and all that, but he really does bring it to it, and it's nice to kind of see the relationship between him and Alex Wolf, even if it's not explored as much as it probably should be. Um, there's still something there, and he's not just necessarily a throwaway role, and he does bring that out as well. Um, and of course, Millie, I forgot her last name, damn it, um, who plays Charlie, the, the clicking tongue girl. Um, who's kind of who's kind of been the face of the movie and uh, the advertisements, to my understanding. So, yeah. So just really, really good stuff here. Uh, A twenty four continues to live up to the uh, great horror stuff it's been putting out. So, yes, it's, it goes along nicely with the witch and it comes at night and all those. So, yes. Uh, so let's go right into Ocean's Eight. Um, Ocean's Eight is a movie that I wasn't particularly excited about. Um, not because they were doing the whole, you know, all women thing, or it felt like, you know, it was going to be this, you know, seem pointless and like a just a knockoff for no reason because they're out of ideas thing or whatever. Um, the, the main reasons I wasn't excited for this were the fact that I think Ocean's Eleven style is awfully played out. The people being cool while jazzy music plays and they get away with stuff and they say, oh, this is how we did it, and they play scenes over again, showing us how clever they were before and all that. This was played out, this was played out by the time Ocean's 12 had come out. That's how, that's how long um, I've just kind of not been into this anymore. Um, not to mention the fact that um, I just learned, like, last month or so, that the woman who co-wrote this with... Um, Gary Ross, the director, is the woman that wrote and directed Dude, the absolutely ridiculously awful, one of the worst of the year Netflix movies. So, yes, that also had Aquafina in it. But, um, yeah, it's, but it kind of, it eases you in pretty quickly and pretty easily. It does kind of start off, um, it does have, like, the same start as Ocean's Eleven when we saw, uh, like, Clooney come in as he's getting released and he has to talk to them and all that and they do the parole thing and all that. Um, and then we do kind of get to see Bullock go right into this. She does the nice kind of switch thing where she plays it off like the innocent, oh, I've changed my life, I'm just, I just want to get out there and be a better person thing. And then like as soon as she's granted freedom, we just see the turn and she's still like this, you know, relentless con woman and all that. We watch her go through her just sort of doing like, you know, petty shit and like just lifting things left and right, and be, just being like this natural-born, you know, con person. Uh, and the whole, um, she does like the reverse Peter Sarsgaard scam in Garden State. Um, they, um, she kind of like just suavely lives this sort of high-class life just through all these different methods. Um, it is one of those things where you can kind of point holes, and it's like, I don't think she'd be able to make that work for very long, but, um, we're supposed to buy that the character does, and for the most part, Bullock sells that pretty well. Um, and then, yes, they do, um, they do tie in the movie. She's, I had heard that she was supposed to be, like, some cousin of Danny Oceans or something, but no, they, um, as because they tell us many, many times, um, she's the sister of Danny Ocean, who is supposedly dead now, but the movie keeps telling us, I kept waiting for a Clooney cameo that ultimately didn't happen, but they keep, they just kept saying throughout the whole movie that, you know, he has, he has like, you know, a gravestone and a mausoleum and all that, and they talk about how he's dead and all that, um, but nobody in the movie seems convinced that he's dead. Uh, like, when she first goes to visit the grave, like, the first thing she says is, you better be in there. And I do kind of like that they address that immediately, because it's sort of that thing to where you, like, you think it's going to try to, like, play you, and it's like, oh, Danny Ocean's dead, Danny Ocean's dead, and then, like, oh, you know, whatever. But, um, no, the movie kind of just right away just says, this may totally not be true, <laughs> especially knowing the character. Um, so that, that felt something, felt like something really smart kind of right away, so that helped. Um... And then as we continue, and they do sort of, talking about that also, um, there is one problem that the movie kind of has, and that is the, it's not even, I can't even necessarily say exposition, because you know how movies just like blurt out exposition sloppily, and you can like really easily tell they're just trying to tell you the important things, but 
the screenwriter isn't all that skilled. <laughs> um, the thing is, is that they give you the exposition fine. It's the fact that I they don't seem to think that you've got it, so they keep repeating it in, like, every other scene. Whether it be, um, like, almost every other scene is brought up, you know, oh no, Danny Ocean is apparently dead, or maybe he's not, or whatever. And they just kind of keep saying that even when it's doesn't it's not really necessary. Or the fact that um, Sandra Bullock just has to keep saying the line, you know, I just got out of jail. And it's like, we know you just got out of jail, because it's on the first scene. But um, they have to keep saying that, so... Um, and you, you kind of feel like they just are really desperately afraid that you're going to forget some important detail, and it's sort of like, it kind of doesn't quite show a faith in the audience to get the blatantly obvious, but um, it's... Yeah, so, but like I said, they do balance that out, where when we have something like that, we also have something like them, you know, addressing immediately. We don't fully expect you to believe we've killed Danny Ocean or anything, so there's there's some smart to go along with the sort of clunky, so it more or less balances out. Um, and then it's sort of the way that they, I, I imagine one of the big concerns people probably have is... Is this just going to be a big old copy of the Soderbergh style? Soderbergh is a producer on it, but um, it's like, these movies have such a distinctive style, played out as it is. Um, it's like, are they just going to do that? And I'm sure it'll still get that criticism, but there, it, I don't feel like it quite does that. I don't know that it, it doesn't feel like it has its own thing, because it feels like, you know, we've seen it a billion times over, not just in the Ocean movies. Um, but it doesn't necessarily feel like too much of a copy of those. It does kind of have that same kind of suave quality, the way it goes from sort of we just kind of like go into one thing and then the other like so smoothly and all that and like the soundtrack and all that and everybody acting like they're smooth. We do get those moments where it's like, hey, here's all the scenes you just saw, but this is the shit we were doing that you didn't see and all that. But um, it's still, it, it doesn't necessarily feel like it's like because the problem that I kind of have with the fact that Gary Ross was directing is not... I mean, he's been, he's made some great stuff um, where he's not super flashy, like Pleasantville and, like, Seabiscuit and all that. Not that Seabiscuit is great, but it's not, like, overly flashy. Um, but then you look at the way he directed The Hunger Games, and you're like, I can totally see this guy just completely losing his mind trying to evoke what Spielberg was doing with the Oceans movies if he can get that frenetic. Um, but no, there, there doesn't really seem to be much of an over-direction here, which is what I feared most from Ross, which, um, yeah, is fine. And then as, as the story goes on, they do have those little moments in there that make it kind of fun. Like, they seem like really small obstacles, but they cause big problems. We keep running into those throughout it. Um, and yeah, it does kind of just maintain its flow through most of the thing, which really, in a movie like this, is the most important thing. Just maintaining that flow and not really completely going, you know, out of its way to be too different, but also too the same. It just, yeah, it just has a nice kind of flow to it. And we're introducing uh, all the other women. Kate Blanchett... First off, Kate Blanchett is a bit too big of a name, I think, for this role. <laughs> um, and uh, really, this movie, despite the fact that, you know, Bullock headlines it. But um, she's like, she's kind of like the tough, no-nonsense one. But she's also, I mean, you could compare her to Brad Pitt's Rusty because she's technically like the second in command in this operation or whatever. But they're they're not similar characters at all. Um, but there's also, there's something, you know, kind of nice and wicked that's fun about it that Blanchett's able to bring to it, but overall, she just really doesn't have enough to do. Like, it kind of surprised me at the end when I realized, we, they just really don't show, every time she'd show up, it'd be kind of like, they don't really show her very much, come to think of it. Um, so yeah, and, um, we do have, you know, additions like, Aquafina, where it's like she's basically the next, you know, big thing that's getting shoved down our throats, whether we like it or not. Uh, and I'm sure some, I'm sure, I'm sure some people probably think that she's like some big comedy genius or something. But it's the thing where you, it's just kind of a thing where you can just see right through it. You can see that this is somebody that whoever high above is trying to shove down audiences' throats and make the next big thing instead of just letting it gradually happen. The way she's... This is the way she fucking was not dude, too. It's every single line deliver she has, she might as well just be looking straight at the camera and saying, I'm the funny one. I'm saying things that are funny. And it's it's really irritating to watch. So, I mean, I, mean, she, I can... I, I can see her, like, maybe, like, winning over later down the line, but as of right now, not really. 
Uh, <laughs> and there's people like Mindy Kaling who have never really done too much. Um, f like, I've never really seen much of the appeal. Every now and then she's got a nice line, like, um, when she's looking at the, uh, when they're doing the Megala thing, where they're gonna, what they're gonna rob from, and she sees, like, all the slurs are gonna be there, and she's like, you know, do we have to rob them? Can we just, like, go to this? <laughs> Which is pretty funny. Um, the great Sarah Paulson is here a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, but they're also, um, their, their little pawn in it, their unknowing pawn is Anne Hathaway, who's kind of this... So, sort of a surprising casting choice for this role, where she's like the kind of ultimate diva type, which she plays quite well. Um, I'm, once again, I'm not sure she would have been my first thought when it came to casting this role, but um, she actually did that pretty effectively. Um, and Helena Bonham Carter basically doing her Helena Bonham Carter thing, which is fine in this context um, with the amount of time that we get her, so... There is that. Every now and then it's sort of like, um, there's a bit too much of an ineptitude. Like the moment when Carter first meets Anne Hathaway, and she's basically slowly easing her into this plan, once again, unknowingly. But we have Bullock and Blanchett, like, right outside the window, watching this happen to make sure it goes right. And it's clear it's for comedic effect, but it feels so incredibly not smooth, <laughs> which is exactly what these people are supposed to be. I mean, sure, Carter's supposed to be sort of, uh, I just got ripped into this, but I mean, these are the professionals just hanging outside the window and watching this stuff um, very unprofessionally, and it's... That kind of takes out of the whole, you know, smoothness factor a little bit, the suaveness of it or whatever. Um, but yeah, but there's also, um, there's kind of a gadget aspect to it that's kind of nice. Like, um, the scene when Lennon Carter has to, like, use her glasses to scan the, um, the necklace they're going to steal so that they can, like, copy it. Uh, it's like this really kind of fun scene that's almost like one of those, like, we only have so much time kind of scenes, uh, which plays out nicely. Um, but there's us. oh yeah, somebody I forgot. Totally not surprised I forgot. Uh, Rihanna. Rihanna's another one of those predictable cases to where it's like, you can kind of tell that, uh, they didn't exactly cast Rihanna because they thought Rihanna was a really good actress that deserved to be among the likes of Sandra Bullock and Kate Blanchett and Anne Hathaway and just all these. That's four Oscars right there between the three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, so it's, that, that's another one of those things. Like Aquafina, it just felt so obviously like a sort of studio move to where it's like, well, we've got these great actresses who have, like, proved themselves and won Oscars and shit. Let's throw in people for another crowd, like Rihanna. And it's like, that's just, mm, I don't know, it's like... Yeah, you can just see the quality of the cast, and then it just, like, drops off suddenly. <laughs> There's no, like, gradual kind of down thing. Um, I put Sarah Paulson up there with the, the really good ones, too. So that's that just seemed weird and definitely seemed unbalanced in regards to the quality we were working with here. That's not to say that she's bad in it. She's not really. But it's just, like I said, it's just so off-putting because it just seems like such a... Yeah, such an obvious move, and I just, yeah. Um, man, there's also, um, and in the last, you know, 20 minutes or so, we got James Corden, who comes in and basically does the Hillary Swank role in Logan Lucky, which, funnily enough, brings us back to Soderbergh, um, who's, who, who has a nice little kind of uh, fun quality to the let's see exactly what happened aspect of the movie, so there is that. Um, so yeah, overall, like I said, there's a fun quality to it, it's got a really nice flow. I'm using fun way too much in this. Uh, <laughs> I need to find another term. Um, it just flows nicely, it's not boring, and it does, while it does not feel original in the slightest, like I said, not just the ocean movies, but it just feels like nothing in this movie feels fresh by any means. Um, it doesn't feel lazy either, if that makes sense. Um, it does feel like, you know, like the way the plan goes through and what the plan is and the little twists and turns they throw in there. Um, it, some thought did go into this. It wasn't just, a, uh, oh, let's just continue this because what else are we going to do? Um, and it's not necessarily even something you go against for just saying, you know, like, you know, if they wanted to give women a movie like this, why not make it its own movie? Why make it an ocean movie? But, um, yeah, even so, it's fine. So... 
uh, that stuff just kind of, you know, falls to the side, and you just kind of take it for what it is, and it's it's okay. So, yes. Um, so, that's going to be it for this. Like I said, hopefully I will have somehow seen Hotel Artemis by next week, and I think that's also The Incredibles 2 and Tag. I would like to try to get to all of those. I'm not sure. Um, and I've got Versus playing for, like, the rest of the month, so we'll get to see where that goes. So, uh, yeah, so that's what we have, and until whatever else is coming, uh, that'll... That